Well, many aspects of motorsports have improved since the mid-1960s, but one thing I liked better back then was the fact that top drivers often raced in different series. The stars of the day did not confine their competition to one particular specialty, and that meant in 1966, just a week after Jackie Stewart, Graham Hill, and Jim Clark dueled for victory at the Grand Prix of Monaco, they were challenging the best American oval track drivers for victory in the Indianapolis 500. Imagine how great it would be to see Michael Schumacher and Mika Hakkinen come to America to race our open wheeled series and having Jeff Gordon and Dale Earnhardt thrown in as well. That kind of cross-discipline racing happened a lot in the 60s and 70s. So let's go back now to 1966 and see how the visiting drivers fared against the regular Indy veterans. We saw earlier how Clark scored the first win for a rear engine car. Now let's see what the cars at the Speedway looked like with a year of development behind them. The names of the drivers battling for 500 victory will sound familiar. Beach 500 starts on that warm spring day early in May when the track first opens for practice. Everything that moves at the Speedway is supervised by a technical staff headed up by Chief Steward Harlan Fengler, an ex-driver himself. For half a century, the assault on this track has been renewed each year. Veterans like Roger Ward, who has beaten the track twice in 15 years, still have a healthy respect for this treacherous old race course. Mario Andretti learned in one year that you can't give anything away to this track. Against a background of empty stands and only an occasional spectator, the drama begins. Jim Clark, 1965 winner and defending champion, is here with Colin Chapman of Lotus Cars. The signal is go. And the track is now open for practice. This is the end of a long journey that may have begun in California or England or Texas or Canada. There are 79 entries, 79 variations in design, chassis, engine, suspension, and almost as many drivers, all hoping to find the right combination to put car and driver in the race. The wraps are off. The car builder's job is done. The mechanic's gone as far as he can go on the bench. Now, it's up to the driver to find out if the combination works on the track. This is one of the loneliest moments in sports. One man, alone in the cockpit, facing the unknown. second at a time, men still seek a faster, better way around, despite the hardships of broken metal, miscalculations, and bad luck. is retold each spring in practice. 150 miles per hour was the record speed in 1962. With the onslaught of the radical rear engine cars in the hands of international drivers, speeds climbed 11 miles an hour in four years. Americans were quick to take up the challenge. The British kept up the pressure. 
And then this year, Mario Andretti jumped the speed to an incredible 167 miles per hour. Amazing both Jim Clark, the flying Scott who started it all, and the American competition. In 1966, more than ever before, the 500 is truly international. Mario Andretti, USAC national champion from Nazareth, Pennsylvania, lived up to the promise of his practice speeds, qualifying at nearly 166 miles per hour, four and a half miles an hour faster than A.J. Foyt's record speed in 1965. Californian George Snyder takes the outside position in the first row. Jimmy Clark puts his STP gasoline treatment special next to Andretti in the front row. There are only four days of qualifications when time and speed are official. Four laps, ten miles. Less than four minutes on the track to prove a year's worth. Al Unser, Jimmy Clark's teammate, in an almost identical car, qualifies his STP oil treatment special, number 18. The field, for the first time, averaging over 160 miles an hour, four miles an hour faster than last year, is full. Officials can relax. Qualifications are over. From the time of the first race in 1911, the Indianapolis 500 has become the biggest single sports event in the world. Over 300,000 fans share with the participants the glory and the traditions of this Memorial Day Classic. Stakes are the biggest in the racing world, almost three quarters of a million dollars. But more than that, the Indianapolis 500 has been the supreme challenge to the genius of automotive designers and builders and the skill and courage of drivers the world over. Well, the big moment that we've been waiting for has arrived. And to do honors to this moment, with those famous words, here is Mr. Tony Alban. Gentlemen, start your engines. Thirty-three cars. 11 rows, three abreast, fire up, and get the go-ahead from the pace car for the parade lap. Take a look at what happened in slow motion as drivers describe what they saw and felt. I almost made it past the mess. Some fella alongside of the guy in front of me hit him, knocked him into the wall. He climbed up partially on the wall and then came down and drove over top of me. And by that time, my car had been hit by a few other cars, and I think I had climbed over a couple of them, and it's a mess. A year's, a year's work down the drain. I just said to myself, uh, this can't be true. All of a sudden, up ahead of me, I saw uh, wheels flying and cars flipping, and when I got there, the gate was closed. Drivers scrambled out of their cars before they stopped rolling. A.J. Foyt scales a 12-foot steel cable fence to join the spectators. Amazingly, no driver is injured, but of the 16 cars involved, 11 will race no more today. Newly designed fuel cells prevent fires, but the safety patrol sprays down cars as a precaution. The smoke-like foam covers the scene of one of the worst accidents in Indianapolis 500 history. I didn't hit anything. I figure I'm pretty lucky. Luck is a point of view. A year's work lost is hard to take for those out of the race. These men are professionals and know the risks of racing. Yet when something like this does happen, they question why like Dan Gurney. Collectively, I don't know really who is to blame. I don't think you'll be able to blame it on any one person, but they're all using very, very poor judgment. 
It's not very difficult to drive down a little straight piece of track here with a few cars around. There shouldn't be any trouble at all. We're supposed to be good drivers, and it's uh, just uh, I don't think they have the judgment of a flea for, for all I'm concerned. Foyt had this to say. It was really ridiculous what happened. And just glad nobody got hurt real bad. And that's about all. I guess uh, another year we'll have to wait. Right now I'm pulling for my team car that George Snyder drives, so maybe we can still bring in a victory. For the cars that got through, the race is stopped until the track is cleared. For those who didn't, all that is left is the memory of the struggle just to get in the race. After one hour and 24 minutes of cleanup, only skid marks remain. The rest is history. It's a new race and a new start. Mario Andretti leads the remaining 17 cars into the first high-speed lap. Single file in the order they qualify. Look out! Johnny Boyd spins! He's all right and hustles off the track. Andretti is smoking badly. Clint Bronner, Andretti's mechanic, is concerned. Andretti is in trouble. Clark has moved out in front on the back stretch. George Snyder loses it. And Chuck Holtz falls right into him. Magnificent driving gets everybody by without further incident. Mario Andretti, the fastest man in Indianapolis history, is out with a drop valve. We started blowing oil, and then they brought me in. There was no use. This is only one race, and uh, what the heck. Clark begins to build up a lead as Lloyd Ruby slips inside Carnelli Jones to take second. The race settles down to racing. CP crew relaxes. Chapman nods his approval, and for Granatelli, the elusive victory is within reach. But look out! Jim Clark spins! Stays clear of the wall in traffic, and recovers! Arnelli Jones, the 1963 winner, runs out of car in the same lap. Only 22 laps after his last pit stop, and Clark comes in again. Because of his mishap, he's giving away a pit stop to his competition, canceling out a 27-second lead on Ruby and a full lap on the rest of the field. Here comes Ruby taking the lead. Clark charges out. Ruby has a 30-second edge. Clark has to hustle. He's now in the same lap with Stewart and McCluskey running third and fourth. McElreath is fifth. Al Unser is sixth in number 18 STP. And Graham Hill, number 24, is in seventh place. Almost a full lap behind, but still a threat. Crews trained in racing keep careful records not only of their own cars, but of the competition. Drivers depend on this information for race strategy. The halfway point, and the laps begin to click away. Drivers on the sidelines are not listed in paid attendance statistics, but there is no question there has been a price of admission. The race grinds on. If Parnelli Jones can't ride, he can walk. Drivers visit with the fans. And the fans are restless, too. There's 450 acres to move around in. Speedway gates open at 5 a.m., and it's been a long day. On the track, there's no let-up after two hours of racing. The front runners make their final scheduled pit stop. stop was slow, 53 seconds. McElreath starts to go and stalls.
field's crew battles the hoses and gets him away in 26 seconds. Al Unser in a hustling pit stop directed by the Granatelli boys takes just 17 seconds. McElroy finally gets going after almost two minutes. A tough break. Here comes Clark. This is his third blistering stop to the others, too. Stewart's running fast in third place, and his chief mechanic, Bignotti, wonders if he can get around before Clark gets out. Clark's away in a record 17 seconds as Stewart roars down the straightaway. And it's Ruby's car that's smoking. The battle for the lead is now between Clark and Stewart. Brother Scots, who are not giving anything away on this speedway. And Stewart passes Clark to run in front. Ruby Pitts. The crew works frantically on the oil leak as USAC officials check. The jovial Scott builds his lead over the flying Scott. And it's no go for Ruby. Bitter disappointment for driver and crew. 400 miles down, 100 miles to go. Uh-oh, trouble in the fourth turn. It's third place runner Al Unser, number 18. Well, that moves Graham Hill in car number 24 into the third position now. Al Unser is unhurt. Jim Clark in the number two position. After the accident, the field is bunched together. Jackie Stewart is almost a full lap lead on the second place car. Just those two cars on the same lap. Let's stop the action on the back stretch for a moment. From left to right, Clark, number 19, is in second place. McElree, in the next car, in fourth place, is not in immediate contention for the lead. Next, it's Hill. On the outside, first place Stewart is making his move to lap Clark. When Stewart passes Clark, he'll pick up a lap. When Hill passes Clark, he takes over second place. These are the official standings, but the STP crew and the track announcer both think that Hill is a lap behind and just getting into the same lap with Clark when he makes the pass. Clark and Graham Hill are on the same lap. Now the report from the official scoring is that Graham Hill has moved into the number two position. The track announcer reverses himself as Chapman and Granatelli are amazed. Not so, they say. Even the Meekum crew for Stewart and Hill is not sure where they are. Hill, number 24, and McElreath, number 3, are running second and fourth. Jim Clark gets around Stewart. And now he is in the same lap with the leader. Confusion is the word. to accept second place. But there is the STP sign telling Clark he is holding second position. Clark crosses the short shoot alone. What's happened to Stewart? Stewart is slowing down. The number three turn is the race leader. Car number 43 is down below the white line with the power off. In true road racing fashion, Stewart pushes his car back to the pits. The tower shows number 24 first, number 19 second. The number one board for Hill. The number one board for Clark. Now it's total confusion. Chapman cheers Clark on. 
Beckham assures his crew that Hill is number one. The checkered flag for Graham Hill. Chapman crosses the pit road to cheer Clark on to victory. But it's official for Graham Hill and the Meekum team. 44, as he moves down toward victory lane, and due to the signals given Jim Clark, I wouldn't be a bit surprised to see him pull down in there, too. His crew is there already. They still think he won. Graham Hill, somewhat stunned by it all, is pleased. And his crew chief, George McNaughty, is ecstatic in his third win in the last six races. The winner's kiss would seem to make the trip worthwhile. The car ran beautifully, and actually I'm very pleased. I think I, was, um, I had a very uneventful run. Well, I think we've had a hell of a race, and uh, boy, it was certainly full of surprises. Uh, I was very, very sorry to see the accident right at the beginning, and uh, a certain amount of confusion during the race, but... Um, Graham's the winner at the moment, and uh, I would really wish to congratulate him on that. And I was, must admit, I was delighted to see at the end three European drivers having a go. In that amazing starting line pileup, one third of the entire field was wrecked too badly to continue. The great contenders sidelined included the luckless Dan Gurney and A.J. Foyt, and yet the only injury sustained was a cut hand for A.J., and he got that trying to climb the debris fence to get away from the carnage all around him. When Graham Hill reached Victory Circle, Jimmy Clark was headed the same way, believing he'd won the race for the second straight year. That until the scoring error was found. The Victory Circle celebration at Indy, of course, begins with a cold gulp of milk. And when Clark ribbed Hill about who had actually won the race, Hill said, of course I won, mate. I drank the milk. That's going to do it for this trip back to the 1960s. I'm Dave Spain. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Victory Circle.